Hi friends, Apostle Price here. This year, we are celebrating 35 years of ever-increasing faith television. We are still walking by faith. During this year, we will air some of our most popular classic series from years gone by. Remember, you have made it happen for the past 35 years. I appreciate your loyalty. Stay with us and enjoy my classic teachings. Get involved. Visit faithdome.org for more details. From Los Angeles, California, ever increasing faith with pastor and teacher, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price. Welcome to Ever Increasing Faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Well, praise God for another day, and for another privilege, an opportunity to share with you the living word of God. Well, are you ready? Yes! All right. We're going to do something today. We're going to start a new series. And I first taught this message in 1979 but I never did teach it for television because there were some areas in it and some things about it that we thought perhaps would be a little bit too heavy for folk and we didn't want to get censored and we didn't want to get into any trouble with uh, any station but I believe that the time has come that I should deal with this subject and let the chips fall where they may and so I'm going to be talking for however long it takes us to go through it from the subject, the Christian family. Amen. And we will be teaching this in all of the three services. So if you miss one service, you ought to be able to get in on the other service because it'll be the same thing each one of the sessions each week. And to get the maximum benefit out of this subject, you need to hear all of it if you can. And I challenge the people in the other service this morning with something that I think I'd like to challenge you with. Because some people have a difficult time doing something the same way over a protracted period of time. And that is that I want to challenge you for this series, if, if you've never done it before, for this series, make it your commitment to be at every one of them. Some of you, bless your heart, you couldn't go nine weeks in a row to save your life. If, if it meant your life, you just couldn't do it nine weeks in a row. Now, certainly there may be extenuating circumstances. You know that, I know that. So you have to deal with that as it comes. But what I'm saying is, set yourself to make all of these in this, in this series. Just set this uh, as a goal to make this. And just tell the devil and everybody else, don't bother me, bug off. I'm going on Sunday. I'm having a commitment. I already have an appointment on Sunday. I'm committed for, let's say, the next 10 weeks. I don't know if it's going to take that long, but uh, it may. may take less. I don't know. But make that a commitment, because you need to hear everything in sequential order, okay? If you miss one part, you're going to miss a whole segment. I'm going to be dealing with some very important areas, and uh, I believe you're going to want to get in on it. I believe it's going to be helpful to you. Now, before I begin today, I want to preface this series by doing something a little different, but I believe that it will be helpful to you. Now, in this series, The Christian Family, by virtue of the fact that it's talking about the family, I will be getting into some very personal and into some very intimate areas of our lives as Christians, because that's where we live our lives. And it will not be my intent to be crass or vulgar, but it is my intention to be understood. With Fred Price, the bottom line is always, when you leave my presence, I want you to be able to say, I understood what he said. You might disagree with it. You might not agree with me. You might not 
like the way I said it. You might not like my choice of words, but at least you won't be able to say, I didn't understand what he was talking about. You'll be able to go away knowing what I said, understanding what I've said. Now, we're going, to, we're going to be talking about some things, as I say, that are very personal. We're going to end up talking about sexual relationship, because that's a part of the Christian family. If you didn't know that, that's a part of marriage. And we're going to, I'm going to be talking about it. I will be talking about it probably very explicitly, not for the, for the sake of being sensational. But I want to deal with it down on a level where we live. Now, I know that there are some people that are prudish. They have a problem when it comes to dealing with intimate, personal things like sex or anything like that in a public way. I mean, that's just, to them, that's gross. I don't intend to be gross. If, if it comes off that way to you, then I'm sorry. But that's not my intent. And the only reason that I'm telling you about it now is because you may have children that you don't want to hear this. Maybe your children are at an age where you're not ready for them to hear about some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. So you might want to guard yourself against this. We get many, many letters from children. I get letters all the time from kids that watch the program because they can understand it. They understand what I'm saying. And so the parents, you need to, take, you need to guard as to whether you want your children to hear this from me at this point or you'd rather for them to hear it from you before they hear it from anybody else. And that's fine with me. I have no problem with that. I don't know exactly where at, at in the message or in the series that I will be saying certain things or dealing with certain particular aspects of the Christian family. For instance, sex. I, I know I probably won't be dealing with it today. I will say some things maybe in a very, uh, you know, in a simple way. But when we get into that particular point, uh, I'm, I'm just going to let it all hang out from the standpoint of simply making it plain. The pulpit has never addressed these areas. Amen. Never addressed these areas. They have just sort of flittered over them like birds flying from tree to tree. And yet, they're one of the most common problem areas, the area of sex, that we have to deal with as ministers in counseling with people, in marriage relationships and all that. And it, it plays a very prominent part. And so, uh, I'm not afraid to deal with things. Um, I believe that's a part of my assignment. I don't know what God told some other preacher to do. I don't know. I know what he told me to do. And so I'm going to be obedient to the best of my ability to my calling and to my assignment because I'm going to have to one day give an account for my assignment. I can't do what somebody else is doing, but I have to do what God told me to do. And I'm, one thing I'm clear about, I know my assignment. I know what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to deal with it. And so I want to just simply say that ahead of time so that if you do have a problem with sex, if, you, if you're a prudish person, then you might want, not want to come to these, these uh, series or this series and these messages on this subject. So I'm telling you ahead of time, what else can I do? Okay? And so I, I want to say that so that you understand where I'm coming from so when you hear it, you won't go, Oh, why did he say that? Well, I'm telling you now, I may say, I don't know what I'm going to say. I mean, I'm not sitting around planning and plotting how I'm going to say it. I don't know how it's going to come out. I don't work from a script. Okay? I don't, I don't have a, a pre-written script by some writer who's writing my copy for me. Okay? I operate by the Holy Spirit to the best of my ability. And then the Holy Spirit uses me in my life, in my personality, the way I am, to get that part across to the people that need it. Now, you may not be in the category. See, everybody's not for everybody. And I realize that. And, and maybe I'm not for you. I, I'm down on a, a low level. I'm simple and easy to understand, if you'll just listen. Now, you go to some churches and you hear very erudite and scholarly terminologies. You'll never hear any of what we call the vernacular of the street. They don't use that in those high ecclesiastical and high academic circles. And that's fine. I'm not putting that down. But I'm, just, I'm sent to the common people. You know, Jesus said, when he was accused about some of the things that he did, he said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. So if you're not lost, I'm not here for you. But now if you're lost, then I came for you. Are you following me? So I may, Fred, Fred Price may not be for everybody, but I know I'm for somebody. And the somebodies that I'm for, those are the people that I'm talking to. Now, if it doesn't meet your need and doesn't fit you, then just flip off the screen, just shut down your TV 
And those of you that are here today, you'll know whether you want to come back to this or not. And I, no hard feelings with me. I have no problem with it whatsoever. I want to read for you two letters. And I read these two letters only for the purpose of giving, giving you some idea of why I've said what I've just said. Now these letters, uh, neither one of these letters am I reading as a uh, trying to defend anything or am I reading uh, to put anybody down but uh, simply to show you the kind of thinking that's in the congregation, okay? See, I can't talk to everybody personally. And sometimes, you know, you can talk to a person and they're fine until you get to a certain subject. And then when you start talking about that subject, boy, they go to squirming in their seat. I mean, they go to getting hot and sweaty all over. And I mean, you know, they can't handle that. They can't deal with that. Okay? So I want you to get an idea from this so that if you should fit, happen to fit, one of the persons out of these two letters, then you will know whether or not you want to be here for these services, these sessions that we're going to be dealing with in the Christian family. Okay? Now, I'll tell you this, I do not know the persons, either one of the persons. In fact, one of them, I believe this letter, it didn't have a name on it. These kind usually don't. <laughs> no, they don't, they don't usually have a, a name with them. See. So, I want to read this, and I don't know whether the person is here or not, and I, don't, and, I, so, and I don't know the name, and even if I knew the name, I wouldn't read the name because I'm not trying to to embarrass anybody or put anybody down or, or try to, to defend myself and make me look like I'm something and they're not. It's not that, but there's a mentality that is presented in this letter, and I know they're not the only ones like that. So I want to read it so that if you fit that category, you can know ahead of time, I'm not coming to that series. Then that way you won't be offended. Okay? All right, here we go. Dear uh, uh, Dr. Frederick Price, during the 1230 service, January 6, 1985, our family became grieved only because you allow yourself to be very explicit in the female examinations. We don't know how your daughter Angela felt. Maybe she's used to it. God love her. But our 16-year-old daughter and 17-year-old son ask us why did he say that? My son didn't know that women, females, were examined by the finger of some man physician. So he said, then how can a female call herself a virgin when she has already been exploited? I didn't know it was exploitation. I thought that was standard doctor examination procedure. That was my understanding. I talked to females about it. That's what they told me. I mean, it's what the doctor did. I mean, if I said he, you know, if he put a spoon, I, I, you know, I'd be telling a lie. I mean, my God, how many women here have ever been examined by a doctor? Gee, <laughs> big deal. Isn't this, I'm all right. So she said, why did he say that? He didn't know. So he thinks now that because you've been examined that you're no longer a virgin. Bless his heart. All right. He also said, with your extensive vocabulary, you could have softened the blow. I didn't know it was a blow that needed to be softened. I mean, honest, I'm not trying to be funny. I didn't know it soften what would I don't know I don't understand what needs to be softened the exam you know I could have used the statement the exam was next to impossible or something like that now why do you want to tell me how to describe <laughs> what the Lord told me that's like going and telling Rembrandt how come you painted that picture like that <laughs> don't buy the picture and don't look at it you going to tell a man how to paint his picture? I like paintings. I like oil paintings. I like art. And I've been to the art museums. And there's some pictures in the art museum I wouldn't hang up in my garbage disposal, let alone in my room or my house. But do you think the artist cares whether I'm going to hang it up in my house? It's not for me. He didn't paint that picture for me. So I had no problem with the artist and he had no problem with me. After all, his picture's the one hanging in the art gallery. Mine ain't. 
So he must have something on the ball. I don't have any of my paintings in the, oil, in the art gallery. It wouldn't hang none of mine in there. All right. My daughter was crying out of embarrassment because she has a lot of respect for you as my son does. But why does he inflict so much pain? You mean if I mention the word vagina, that's painful to you? My God only knows. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that that would be painful for anybody to hear me say vagina or penis or sexual intercourse or a doctor examining you. I, I, really, I didn't know that that was painful, that I would have to soften the blow. I know what I probably could have said, the birds and the bees. Maybe that would be softening the blow. I'm, so, I'm not trying to be funny. I don't know what else to say. Soften the blow. All right. Um, she said, my insides jump and shrink and even twist up with grief. It's painful to have to sit through some messages and maintain respect for you. God, I didn't know that talking about life was, you know, that I would be disrespected because I tell the truth and talk about things that are, that are real life. Isn't that something? And it's difficult to maintain respect for you. I speak now for my entire family. We love you with the love of the Lord and support this ministry. We love the ministerial staff and support the Bible studies. And we've been here a long time. We will continue to stay, but my children, even though they know that Christ dwells in them, they said if they had brought Jesus in by the hand physically, we would have taken him out because Jesus is more sensitive than we are. To add a second note, my children are virginal in spirit and in body, not because we the parents were or are so great, and not because of any pastor or teacher, and not because we were so rough verbally or physically, but because the tender love of God has been shed abroad in their hearts. They are secure in themselves, and they let their light shine, but believe it or not, we love you, and always will. And we believe we speak for others too, sincerely. No name. <laughs> My family are partners in prayer, Ephesians 4.30. Now, again, I read that letter for only one purpose, to deal with a particular kind of mentality. It is obvious that Fred Price is not for you because this ministry is Fred Price. And you might, as well, you might as well accept that. Whatever this ministry is, it's that because of me. Meaning, this is the way God is working through me. So if you come here to be ministered to, then you have to take me as I am. No, you don't have to agree with everything I say. And you don't have to agree with the way I say them. But apparently, according to that letter, if you've been here a long time, you must have been getting something out of it. Amen. And I haven't, I haven't just started being the way I am. I've been this way for 15 years. Amen. I've always been this way. Just plain and simple and frank and transparent and right out in front. And if it comes off vulgar, I, I mean, I'm sorry. That's not my point. I mean, give me credit for having at least as much intelligence as you do. I know that's a shocker to you. But think about this. I must have something on the ball. If the folks let me on television all over the United States, and if they let me not only on there, but let me stay on there for eight years. We've been on here for eight years. I, I must have a little something going. There must be a little bit of wisdom. And beside that, if I don't have something on my hands, if I don't have something going for me, then everybody in here is a, is a dumbbell. <laughs> now, now why, why do I say that? Because notice this. I am not coming to service to listen to you. You are all coming listening to me. Now, the point, only point I'm making is there must be something here that's beneficial. Okay? So you don't have to eat the sticks. Just eat the straw. Have as much sense as a cow. But don't stop eating just because there's some sticks in the straw. Don't eat the sticks. Eat the straw. But now I read that letter for the purpose that if you are like that, if you think about things like that, personal things, intimate things, sexual things like that, that's your viewpoint, then you don't want to come to these services. 
for the next few weeks that I'm on this series because I may say something like that. I, I'm not, I don't know really how I'm going to say it when I get to that part of the message or that part of the series that talks about saying, I have no idea in my mind what I'm going to say in terms of how I will say it. But if you think I'm going to sit around trying to figure out how to say it so your feelings don't get hurt, <laughs> then you missed it by nine million miles. Because the time I figure out how to say it so I don't hurt your feelings, that'll be the Sunday you don't even show up anyway. <laughs> I messed the whole thing up, waiting for you. I've had that happen in years gone by before I was filled with the Spirit and knew how to operate by the leading of the Holy Spirit. I used to do that. And I said, I'm going to get deacon so-and-so this Sunday. I'm going to jump all over him with the Word of God. I'd build my whole message on deacon so-and-so. You know, deacon so-and-so is that trouble when he's giving me all that trouble in the congregation. So I'm going to get all these scriptures on him. I'm going to be ready for him today. When I come out there, I'm going to be shooting from the hip. Bang, 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 you know. You're going to call me fast, draw McGraw. And I got out there in the pulpit all ready to unload on brother so-and-so and deacon so-and-so. Look out there in the congregation at deacon so-and-so's usual place of setting, and he wasn't even there. And I asked him, where deacon so-and-so? Oh, he's on two weeks vacation. I done built my whole sermon around this dude, and he didn't even show up. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. So I just let it all hang out. So if, if, you, if, you are, if you fit in the category of that type of letter, then I would suggest to you, for at least about the next nine or ten weeks, don't, don't come, don't turn your TV set on, because I don't know what I might say, and I don't want to offend you. See what I mean? And if, it, if those things that I've said, those kind of things that I talk about, if that's offensive to you, then the only thing I can tell you is, to turn off or don't come because I get tell, tell you what I'm not going to not say it I'm going to say whatever the Lord leads me to say it needs to be said nobody else is dealing with it somebody got to deal with it biggest problems we have the biggest things we have to deal with all the time are, are sexual things hmm? and everything in our whole society is sexually oriented everything is pathetic everything in society is sexually oriented everything we get it in advertisement. We get it in every movie. There's a sexual content in every movie, a sexual suggestion in every movie. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying we got to deal with it. You can't run away from it. The only thing you can do is don't ever read any magazines. Don't ever look at a newspaper. Don't ever see a movie. Don't ever look at TV. In fact, go somewhere and hide. <laughs> because if you go anywhere to school or anywhere, your job, on the bus, the airplane, somebody's talking about sex. Or something that has sexual overtones. So that's just a part of life. We don't need to run from it. Deal with it. That's all. Put it under your feet. Amen. All right, here's the second letter. Dear Pastor Price, praise and thanksgiving be unto our loving and merciful Father. I trust this finds you blessed, settling for nothing less. And knowing you, I can boldly say, I know you're not. I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you again for your love and obedience to the Father and in teaching his word uncompromisingly and with boldness. On countless occasions, your boldness and simplicity has set me free. I thank God for your personality. Please, underline, stay bold and don't compromise. I was in the 1230 service on October 13, and the Lord was ministering to us regarding oral sex. I just thank and praise God because we need to know these things, and it's high time for the pulpit to address them. It's life. It's where we live, and we need it. Having been set free from the bondage of sex, which I started at age 13 and am now 26, and sin being progressive, and this world being as it is, regular sex is almost obsolete. And now that I'm delivered, I had my questions about just what is legal for a Christian. I had heard some say everything is legal on a marriage bed, or something to that effect. And having done no study on the subject, just in fellowship with other Christians and my best brother in Christ, who is a more mature Christian than I, I had questions about rightful sex in marriage. I rationalized some acts right out because I knew they weren't normal. But I did have a question about oral sex. I am fully persuaded regarding its place in the Christian marriage bedroom and am confident 
because of the joy and completeness I now have in my intimate relationship with the Father and the revelation and appreciation of the precious union of a man and woman in matrimony to know, being it was an act I enjoyed in the world, in brackets, I will be truly fulfilled without it in my Christian marriage. Thank you for your boldness and love for me and my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in your flock, Pastor Price. Please don't stop because as you put forward the truth, it will make us free. And I, among countless others, want to please God and be free. I agree with you all. I agree with you that all your personal needs are met and your family and the need of your ministry, my home, our 10,000 seat auditorium and the sale of the property on Crenshaw Boulevard with deep, sincere thanks and love in Christ. Well, there you have two different people, two different views of the same man. Uh, and it's sort of like the old saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What was vulgar to one was a blessing to another. Are you following me? So I read the letters only for the purpose. If I wanted to make light of or make fun of the people, I'd mention their names. But that wasn't my point. The point is that if you fit in either one of those categories, if you fit in the latter category, the one I just read, then this message and this ministry is for you. If you fit the first category, then it may not be for you. And so it might, you know, it might be uh, good on your part, wisdom on your part to consider another ministry. I will have no hard feelings about it. Absolutely none whatsoever. I believe you ought to go where you're being ministered to and ministered to where you want to be ministered to. Amen. And if you're not being ministered to that way here, you a fool for coming. Amen. And don't say anything about me saying that. I got that from Jesus and Paul. They use the term fool. Don't get me on that. So I figure if it's all right for the head to say, it's, uh, say fool, it's all right for the body to say fool. And I'm, a, I'm the body of Christ and he's the head. Okay. But I just wanted to preface this study by making those observations. So if you fit that category and if you don't want your kids to hear, don't bring them into service. And don't let them watch it on TV, not while we're going through this series, because I, I'm going to deal with the Christian family, as I say, just as, as, you know, not graphically for the sake of, as I said, sensationalism, but so that when, I, when you turn the TV off, or you, leave and walk, or you leave and walk out of this place, you'll be able to say, I understood what he meant. I understood him. Like I say, you may not agree with it. I could care less if you don't agree with it. I'll just be the one right and you the one wrong. <laughs> what can I say? But the one thing I am concerned about is that you understand me. That you don't go out and say, what in the world did he mean by that? No, I want to make it plain enough. Because if there's any area of our lives that's important, it's the area of the family. And that is the one thing that's been under attack and is under attack is the sanctity of the family unit. If Satan can destroy that, he can destroy the church. But I don't believe he can destroy it. I don't believe that he will destroy it. Because I believe that the truth will make us free. And when we're free, we're free indeed. Amen. So we're going to talk about the Christian family. So I've given you forewarning, and probably when I get to the area of talking about, uh, specifically areas about sex, I may get in, when I do get into that, I'll probably read these letters again, because there'll be new people that will be watching, and there'll be new people, visitors that will be here in the auditorium. And as I say, I, my, my point is not to be vulgar. I don't need to be vulgar. You know, I don't make enough money to be vulgar. They, they pay certain people that I could mention millions of dollars to be vulgar. They don't pay me that. Now, if they paid me millions of dollars, then I might consider being vulgar. But it don't pay. <laughs> it doesn't pay me anyway. I'm not, the board doesn't vote to pay me enough money to be vulgar. See? So if it comes off that way to you, then all I can do is say I'm sorry. Because that's not my intent. But I do want to get right down to where we live. And I've got to make it graphic enough and simple enough for the man on the street to get it. See, I've got to get it down because you see, whether you realize it or not, the majority of people in the world are street folk. Amen. They're not academians Amen. hiding out in the ivy halls of learning. But they're just everyday average people who may or may not have even graduated from high school. And they're out there knocking their nose up against that stone wall every day trying to make it for themselves and their wives and their families and their children. I want to talk to them. Amen. Okay? I want them to, if, if they can understand me, then you guys that are so smart and academic, you ought to be able to deal with it very simply. You ought to do it out of your academic acumen. You ought to be able to handle it, handle it because of your great educational ability. 
and all that that you know, you ought to easily be able to deal with it. Okay? So, here we go. The Christian family. Now, the first thing that I want to deal with in this series is marriage, a divine ordinance. That's the first thing I want to deal with. I want to establish from the Bible the, the ordinance of marriage because the family is built out of the marriage relationship. Now, if the marriage is not right, then that will affect the family in a negative way. And we see this all the time. If there had been the sanctity of marriage, if it had been preserved like God intended for it to be preserved, we wouldn't have so much lawlessness in family situations. You wouldn't have so many unwed mothers. Huh? Amen. See, and if, if I was so vulgar, it's, it's, it's mighty funny that if I, I was so vulgar and I have three daughters... And they're all pretty good lookers. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're appetizing bait. You know, it's, it's not like old, you know, some bait the fish won't even take. And at least uh, two of them I've married off, and they were both virgins when they got married. Amen. And I have a third one on the way, and she is and will be until she gets married. Amen. Uh, so as I'm not, my vulgarity is not doing too bad. Can you say the same? Mm hmm. So just drop your rock before you start throwing, see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So we want to talk about marriage, a divine ordinance. We want to establish from the standpoint of the Bible, what is this business of marriage? Is it ordained of God? Is it something that I should be concerned about? Is it something that we as Christians, do we have to submit to that? Or is it just something somebody dreamed up? to curtail our freedom and our fun in the sun. We want to find out about marriage of divine ordinance. So turn to Genesis chapter 1 and let's start at the beginning. Chapter 2, I should say. Genesis chapter 2. I meant to say we'll start at the first book, book number 1, but the second chapter. We want to establish from the standpoint of the Bible marriage as a divine ordinance. Everything starts at the beginning. Number one comes before number two. If you get one right, then two will be relatively easy to follow. But if you botch up one, you may never get to two. So everything begins with the beginning. Starts out at the beginning, and we need to have that beginning rightly understood. All right, in Genesis chapter one, chapter two, Book 1, chapter 2. I want to begin reading at verse 18. It said, And the Lord God said, underline, Lord God said. Underline the words, Lord God said. Now, as I've told you before, if you can't write in your Bible, get rid of it. And buy you one that you can write in, because this is your textbook. I'll be giving you some things as we go along in this series, as I always do in all of the teaching that I do. And you need to make some notes for yourself because you can't remember it all. As smart as you are, you can't remember it all. See? All right. Verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. So that right, right away tells you that man must have been the first human created. He didn't say it's not good for the woman to be alone. He said it's not good for the man to be alone. So it appears that God created a man before he created a woman. Okay? And God said it's not good that the man should be alone. And I heartily agree with the Lord on that. He was absolutely right. It is not good for Fred to be alone. <laughs> Amen. I don't know about anybody else. Different strokes for different folks. But I'm so grateful that God himself said it. So nobody can argue with this. God said... It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Underline the word help me. That means a helper. Now you see, another place, another area where we get into problem is when people try to get out of their place. You always have a problem. 
You know what kind of problem erupts in the home when the child starts being the parent? What happens in the home when the parent abdicates their responsibility and start acting like a child? You have problems going somewhere to happen. Isn't that true? Well, when everything stays in its order, decent and in order, then everything flows just fine. When you put your right foot in a right shoe, it just fits just so nicely. But when you put your right foot in a left shoe, you got problems. You're out of order. Okay? You still here? All right, now notice. He said, verse, watch this, verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet. So that means that this help meet that God is going to make for man is to help man. Now notice what he doesn't say. Notice that he doesn't say, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a competitor. I will make him a help me, not a competitor, not a competitor, a helper. God said it, I didn't. I disagree with Brother Price, idiot. I didn't say it, God said it. All right, watch this. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help me. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now you talk about a prodigious feat. That was it. And that goes to show you how the human brain operated before sin entered in. I mean, you can't hardly remember how many fingers and hands you have. Can you imagine naming all of the animals? Do you know how many bugs there are? <laughs> Crawling bugs, flying bugs. And Adam named them all. That was quite a feat. All right. Verse 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. This is your first operation, first surgery ever performed on earth. Verse 2, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now notice, notice it says, verse 21, And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs. Now your ribs are at your side. Did you notice it didn't say that the Lord took a bone out of his foot to indicate that he was to stand on top of woman? Did you notice that he didn't take a piece of bone out of his head to indicate that woman should be above man's head? But he took a rib out of his side, indicating that woman was to walk beside man. Not in front of man, not behind man, not underneath man, not above man, but beside man. Yeah. Took a rib from his side. You still here? All right, verse 22. And the rib which, he, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman. So God made woman. And brought her unto the man. God made woman for man. He didn't make man for woman. Now, if you don't like your role, you should talk to your maker. <laughs> don't roll your beady eyes at me. Don't call me a chauvinist pig. You a piglet. If I'm a pig, you a piglet. Huh? You want to call some names? Then just jump on in here. <laughs> huh? 
No. No, it said, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he, God made a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, Woo, look at her, ain't she pretty? <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't say that, does it? And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now notice what it doesn't say here. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his mistress. <laughs> Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Wife is indicative of husband which is indicative of marriage, which is indicative of family. So God ordained the family. It is the divine ordinance. All right, listen. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, not unto his lover, not his mistress, not his whore, Not his kept woman, wife. And they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife. Not the man and his lover. And they were not ashamed. So, again, the term wife in, includes or indicates husband, which includes or indicates marriage, which includes or indicates family. God ordained marriage. Now, any relationship between a man and a woman where they live as though they were married. You see, everything has its privilege. There were certain things that my mother would not allow me to do when I was a child. That was not for me to do then because I was not old enough and I was not in position from maturity standpoint to be involved in that. That is adult stuff. And I was still a child. Do you understand what I mean? There are some things that accrue to you because of your position in life. Amen. Huh? When you're a child, you're expected to act like a child. There are things that are childish. There are some things that are, that are governed and made and designed strictly for you as a child. There will come a day if all things are equal, you will grow out of that childhood stage. And you will grow into an adult stage. And there are certain things that accrue to you as a result of being an adult. I have news for you. There are certain things that accrue to you by virtue of being in a relationship with a man or a woman. And those things that accrue to you should only be in operation if you are married. If you're not married, you're outside the will of God. Now, out in the world, you expect that. Because those people in the world are being influenced by Satan, not by God. Now, they don't know that. Of course they don't. None of us knew that when we were out there. And all of us have been there. You know. And so if you're acting like, doing like, living like, experiencing like married people, as far as God is concerned, you are out of order. And if you're a Christian living in that kind of situation, you are completely out of the will of God. There is no protection for you. You are living on the ragged edge of extinction. And you don't realize it. Huh? Huh? See, 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 God ordained this. Therefore, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, not his mistress, not his girlfriend. You doing any touching or cleaving, it should be to your wife or your husband. Huh? Now, he said in verse 25, And they both, and they were both naked, the man and his wife. The man and his wife. And we're not ashamed. 
All right, let's look at another passage of Scripture that helps to promote the idea and crystallize for us the idea of the divine ordinance of marriage. Proverbs 18, 18 chapter of Proverbs. A Christian family. God honors husbands and wives. Now you understand if you're not married yet, you're still matriculating through perhaps adolescence and you're still single and you're believing God for a mate, etc. Then you understand uh, we're not excluding you. But we're talking about when man and woman come together in an intimate relationship over a protracted period of time, living under the same roof as though they were married, that is taboo for the child of God. Amen. And you need to get out of that thing just like you would get off of a burning ship or a sinking ship. You are in dire straits. There's no protection for you. You've rendered your own ministering spirit. Your guardian angel is helpless to help you because you're out of the will of God. He can't help you. See? And you're living on dangerous ground. In fact, you're living in a perverted situation. No blessing can come to you that way. It's not God blessing you, believe me. All right, watch this. Proverbs 18, verse 22. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So that shows us again that marriage is ordained of God. He didn't say whoso findeth a woman. Whoso findeth a female. Ooh, look at, mm, brothers, look at, ooh, look at that. Mm, mm, mm. Ooh, my goodness. He didn't say that. No, no. He said whoso findeth a wife. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. Now notice, if you're reading from the King James Version of the Bible, you will notice that the word thing is italicized, which indicates that it was not in the original. So you could drop the word thing and it would read like this, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good. That's good enough for me. I mean, he didn't have to say thing. Good, that's, good is good, right? I mean, how can you improve on good? I mean, if it's good, it's good. You don't have to put thing on there, but that's all right. But understand, whoso findeth a wife. So that shows you again that, that marriage is ordained of God. That's the will of God for man and woman's relationship. Okay? Ultimate, personal, intimate relationship. Whoso findeth a what? Wife. Wife findeth a good thing. All right, look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews the 13th chapter. Now, I didn't mention this earlier, but while you're looking that up, we're going to be dealing with divorce. I'll be dealing with divorce. And I tell you right now, I'm going to share something that's very different relative to divorce. And I believe it can be a help and a blessing to some people. I've never heard anybody else deal with it this way. And I believe it was a revelation that the Lord gave me to help to clear the air and help some people that have been in divorce situations. I mean, divorce, I mean, you almost have as many divorces as you do marriages. You have a lot of people that have had divorces in divorce situations. Some that have been divorced more than one time. Somebody needs to deal with that. You know what I mean? More than just condemn it and condemn the people and ostracize them because they've been divorced. But give some kind of a clear-cut explanation about some of these things and, and, and set people free. Jesus said the truth will make you free. It's not going to put you in a box or in bondage. But anyway, we'll get into that when we start talk, when we talk about divorce. All right, Hebrews 13, verse 4. It says, marriage is honorable. Underline the word marriage. So you said, notice it says marriage is honorable. So that would mean that anything outside of marriage relative to the union of a male and a female together would not be honorable. Shacking up wouldn't be honorable. Now, if you don't understand shacking up, they might not use that in the ivy halls of learning that you're used to associating with. But that's just a common street term for man and a woman living together as though they were married. Some people might call it common law. Some people might call it something else. But you know what it is, don't you? Yeah, you. You know. You know, don't you? All right. So he says, marriage is honorable in all. Now, I don't know where people come up with all of these clandestine 
sexual perversions and fantasies out of this verse. I don't understand it. It says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. Now it's obvious that marriage is the subject under discussion. So I believe it's very safe to carry the word marriage into the next facet of the sentence and it would read marriage is honorable in all and the marriage bed undefiled. Now what does that mean? What is it saying? It means exactly what it says. And what it, the real emphasis is not on the marriage bed, but it's on the bed that that man and woman are on that are not married. And it's telling them that that is not honorable. And it is defiled. But the marriage bed, is un, it's honorable. If we're married, it's honorable, and the bed is undefiled. But that's not a license for some kind of sexual perversion. That's not some kind of license for you doing some weird thing out of the fantasy of your mind that has been programmed by Satan. That's not, I don't see where people try to get that and say, well, that undefiled I means we can do anything we want to do. <laughs> that's why you got so many problems now. You've been listening to the devil for so long. That's not what that's saying. All it's saying is that marriage is honorable in the sight of God and the marriage bed is undefiled. Amen. That's the time when the bed is not defiled is when you're married. If you're not married, then it is defiled. But that's not telling you that that's some excuse for you to go off into some kind of weird sexual fantasies. To say, well, we can, just, we can do anything because the marriage bed is, is undefiled. <laughs> so that means we can do just whatever we want to do. Well, just whatever we're big enough to do, we can do it. No, it doesn't. That's not what that verse says. It says marriage is honorable in all. Now, the Lord showed me something. In this verse, marriage is honorable in where? Oh. Now, I want to just show you something, how, how, how Christianity organized, religious Christianity, has really done a disservice to the word of the living God. Now, let me ask you this. If marriage is honorable in all, wouldn't ministers fit into the category of all? And how can some church tell a man... You may be called to God, but you can't serve here and be married. So you have to have a, you have to maintain a celibate or unmarried status in order to qualify to minister here. That can't be God. Amen. I said, that can't be God. Amen. Because if it is, he's contradicting himself. He said, marriage is honorable in all. All would mean all. Because that's what all means, is all. Because that's the etymological meaning of all. Which is all. Which means it doesn't leave anything out. That would have to include ministers. How can some church then say, you cannot be a minister in this organization and call that God's organization and tell a man he can't marry? Or tell a woman she can't marry? It says marriage is honorable and also that means all ministers. And honey, I'm telling you, if anything, ministers are the ones they ought to be married. Amen. Happily married. Because we have more opportunities to deal with people on an interpersonal relationship I don't know about these other ministers, but I, I tell you frankly, and, and I love my wife. We have an excellent relationship, have no problems at home at all. Only problem we have, we just don't have enough time to get together <laughs> like we'd like to, you know, because there's so many things to do. But, honey, there's been a time when these, uh, these little almond-eyed little darlings would come into the office and tears in their eyes about how hard they're having it in their, their relationship and their husbands mistreating them and all that. And I'm looking across that desk at that little darling. <laughs> My, hey, man, what are you talking about? Are you kidding? You know, you, your flesh hasn't been converted yet. You got to keep your eye on your flesh. Man, your flesh, I tell you, and it, has, it doesn't have anything to do with love. It doesn't have anything to do with my wife. But I, I mean, I want to go over to that little darling and walk around that desk and tell her, honey, you don't need to cry. <laughs> you don't need to cry. If your husband won't, I will. <laughs> and some not only think that, they do it. And it's a fact, and we need to face it. Amen. And brother, sister, if I didn't have my game together at home, it would be that much more difficult for me to withstand that kind of temptation. <laughs> I was just recently reading an article. 
And I only say this to show you how widespread this whole subject matter is and why we need to deal with it uncompromisingly, not to put anybody down. I just read an article about a white Catholic priest. And Catholic priests are unmarried. They tell them they can't get married, as far as I know. They may have changed some, they may have some other, but to my knowledge, they, they're not supposed to be married and be a Catholic priest. Now, they may have some difference in that, but what I've ever always heard, they can't. And he was a, a teacher and a counselor in a Catholic school. I don't remember whether they, it was a co-educational school or whether they had, uh, they don't have co-educational schools, do they? Anyway, I don't know what, they don't? Either girls or boys school? Well, any, they have both. Yeah. All right. Anyway, he was a teacher and a counselor. Anyway, he had, some, he had girls under his jurisdiction. And he had this girl. She was a uh, graduated, a high school graduate. He was her counselor during her, her years in the school. And she came back to him after she graduated. Black girl, white priest, came back to her after, came back to him after she graduated for continued counseling along these lines of subjects. Well, it ended up that he very... Uh, tactfully and gingerly inserted his penis in her vagina and the outcome was she had a baby by the Catholic priest. It would have been a lot better for that man to have been married and have his own game together. He might have been able to handle that kind of temptation. Right. It, it had to be some problem on the girl's side too because it takes two to tango. It didn't say he raped her. See what I mean? So she had to consent to it some kind of way. And who needs that? And I can tell you story after story after story about things like that. And folks talking about, you shouldn't talk about that. Are you joking? It needs to be talked about. It happens all the time. And if it was exposed, then maybe it wouldn't happen so often. So these things are real. Oh, ran out of time. But stay right where you are. We're not finished. I'll be back next time. Now remember, if this telecast has been a measure of blessing and inspiration to you, the announcer will tell you some very important information about how you may obtain an audio cassette of the message which you have just heard for your own spiritual enrichment and edification. Remember that these telecasts and radio broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers and listeners. Remember also these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith not by sight. This program is now available to you on CD or DVD to share with your family and friends. CD copies are available for your love gift of any amount. DVD copies are available for your love gift of $15 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Apostle Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Indicate the number you see on your screen. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and join us again on the ever-increasing Faith Network, bringing to you the power of faith to transform.